The moderator recognizes Andy Brown of the Board of Pensions and Deborah Bruce from the Research Services Department to talk about Presbyterian demographics. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, Commissioners and Advisory Delegates, I'm Deborah Bruce from the Research Services Office of the General Assembly Mission Council, and Andrew Brown from the Board of Pensions will be with me to talk to you today about who Presbyterians are and what our congregations look like. It might seem a bit incongruent to follow an important moment like the installation of the State of Clerk with a discussion of demographics, statistics, whole hum sometimes. But part of the charge to Grady was that he helped us keep our eyes on the horizon, to look to the future, to where we're going as a denomination. And in order to do that effectively, it's important that we are be grounded in who we are as a religious community, who we are as a faith group, and who this denomination is. And that's where demographics come in. Uh, we believe that having a good understanding of, of who Presbyterians are and what this denomination is like will help you in your work today, help you know the Presbyterians whose lives will be influenced by the decisions that you'll be making this week. Someone tweeted last night, 85% uh, of Presbyterians love statistics. So 85% of you are going to love this, but 15% stick with us. We'll try not to make it too painful. So first we're going to talk about how many Presbyterians are there in the denomination. This chart you may have seen in the past. It shows the membership has had a slow but steady decline, here shown from 1997 and going forward. Statistics recently released by the Office of the General Assembly show that membership dipped below the 2 million member mark in 2011. And in the last few years, it's been about a 3% decline each year. I, for one, am hopeful that the 1,001 worshiping communities that you'll hear about this week and some of the other initiatives and some of the actions that you will take will help to address this decline. Next, we're going to look at some of the other de demographics of the people in our congregations. First, how old are Presbyterians? If we took all the Presbyterians who showed it up in congregations across the country on Sunday morning and put them in these 15 age categories, all worshipers age 15 and up, would the distribution look like this, where everybody, we have about the same number of Presbyterians in each category? In fact, no, you guys are smart. Um, our research shows that most Presbyterians have college educations, as 60% uh, 60, 60 of Presbyterians do, only about 30% of the population in the United States. So I'm not surprised that you got that right. So here's another distribution. Let's see if the Presbyterians might like, look like this dis distribution. This is the distribution of the US population in these same 15 age, age categories. You can see there are a fair number of those between the ages of 15 and 24, and then there's another blip up of those among 45 and 50 or a little bit older, baby boomers like me. Mortality's impact is seen on the right-hand side where it begins to um, fall off in the highest age categories. Do you think this distribution looks like the distributions of Presbyterians? Unfortunately, no. So what does this distribution look like? This is what the people who worship in our pews, how their ages are distributed. And you can see that um, we do have a fair number in the 15 to 19 age group. Perhaps when children are still at home and are youth and going to church with their parents, they still go. But in that 20 to 34 age range, we've got quite a dip showing there. And then most of our worshipers are over the age of 55. So putting these two side by side, we see remarkably different distributions. Notice to the right that the large blue bars that represent Presbyterians are so much higher than the red bars representing the US population. This means that we have an overabundance of older worshipers in our pews. And to the left-hand side, the red bars that are so much higher than the Presbyterian blue bars show that there are lots and lots of worship, lots and lots of Americans out there in younger age categories who are not in our pews. Now let's look at you. You saw some of these statistics yesterday when we were, you were testing out your keypads. Most advisory delegates are, who are here are in the younger, under, eight, under 25 age group. Hello, Yads. When we look at GA advisory delegates, though, this distribution, I mean, uh, commissioners, thank you, 
this distribution looks a little bit more like the distribution of Presbyterians. Here we've put everybody in the 64, 5 and over in one category, so that's the biggest group that's shown there. The median age of Presbyterians, next slide. The median is simply the midpoint. If we were to line up all Presbyterians by age from youngest to older, the median would be the midpoint. Half are older and half are younger. The median age of commissioners is 60 years old. Here's another way to look at the ages of Presbyterians. We did a survey of worshipers in the pews in 2001 and repeated it in 2008. And here you can see that worshipers on average were three years older in just that seven year period. Pastoral leaders who include solo pastors, head of staff, commission lay pastors and others also, also increased by about three years. What's going on in society at large though? Next slide. The U.S. population has a median age of just 44, and that did not change in that same time period. So our worshipers are older on average and getting older than the U.S. population. An important statistic to keep in mind is that for every worshiper under the age of 24, 25, we have six worshipers over the age of 65. Let me say that again, it's pretty stark. For every worshiper under the age of 25, we have six over the age of 65. So that's a challenge. Let's now look to some of the other demographics of who our worshipers are. This slide shows the uh, distribution of men and women in various categories. You can see six in 10 members are women. Among ruling elders, it's split pretty much 50-50. Teaching elders, though, two thirds are men. That 33% of teaching elders who are women is a percentage that is increasing and we think it will continue to increase into the future. Among this group here, commissioners, uh, a few more men than women, probably because there are many teaching elders among your group, and advisory delegates, a few more women than men. In the U.S. population, it's split very evenly. A distribution looks very much like that for ruling elders. Race, ethnicity of Presbyterians. Despite uh, considerable efforts in recent years to increase the diversity in our congregations, uh, still large majorities of our worshipers, ruling elders, and teaching elders are white. The first three columns, that three, first three rows there, are probably a little bit overestimating the number who are white because it's based on a survey and there is considerable research that shows that people who are not white are less likely to ter return their survey and tell us their race and, and ethnicity. Among commissioners, a little bit more diversity. Only 84% are white. And among advisory delegates, 77% are white. Recent research that we, we have completed shows that worshipers in fairly no congregations, those who were founded in the last 20 years, show more racial ethnic diversity. About 80% of worshipers in new congregations are white. And so that's a good thing for the denomination. The U.S. as a whole, 72% are white, and that's a figure that continues to decline. So we show a difference from that of the population there as well. Um, three quarters of members are married, as are more than 80% of ruling elders and teaching elders. Among the U.S. population, it's just half. So this is a challenge for congregations to ensure that their services, their ministries, their uh, facilities, everything that they're doing is entirely um, welcoming to people who are single, whether they have never been married, are widowed or divorced. Also, I'll t tell you that Presbyterian congregations have very few single parent families. Only about 5% of worshipers say that they live in a single parent household. Finally, we asked uh, uh, in a survey given in the pew, are you a member here? And this is a phenomenon that we heard some um, pastors talking about, that, that they're seeing it more often in their congregation. And in fact, 16% of worshipers said, I regularly participate or I just, I'm not a member here, but here I am participating in worship. And this is something that we thought would be increasing. We asked it in 2001 and again in 2008 and didn't really see much change. However, this not, Participating non-members is closely tied to the age of the worshipers. On the next slide, you'll see that of, among those who are in the oldest grade age group, 45 and up, only 14% are participating non-members. The difference, though, is for those who are between the ages of 15 and 24. One third of those are participating non-members. 
What we don't know is what this will happen over the years. There's some research that shows that lots of organizations, not just congregations, are feeling this, that there are young people who are participating in their programs, um, helping and being a part, but not taking that official membership step. Whether these um, young people will join our congregations in the future, we don't know, or maybe in the future we will have a greater number of non-participating members at all age groups. This is a challenge for um, congregations and for the denomination as a whole. Thank you. I'm going to turn out to, over to Andrew Brown now. Mr. Moderator, my name is Andy Brown. It's my honor to serve on the staff of the Board of Pensions. As one small part of a two-year demographic study, the board examined the ages of those teaching elders in the benefits plan and found that their ages not surprisingly closely resembled the age chart of Presbyterian members that Deborah showed just a moment ago. We wanted to know how we got here, so we ran the clock back to 1995. At that time, we don't quite have a regular bell curve, but we have a fairly even distribution across the age groups with the largest population between ages 40 and 44 representing about 17% of ministers. When we move up five years, those who were in the 40 to 44 year age bulge are now between 45 and 49 and make up a slightly larger percentage of the population. Moving forward another five years, the bulge moves forward five years and the graph becomes a little less normal and a little more distorted. And that group is now between 50 and 54 and represents nearly a quarter of ministers. Finally, in 2010, this largest group is between 50 and 55 and 59, and two-thirds of ministers enrolled for benefits are over the age of 50. In 1995, 39 percent of ministers were under the age of 45. By 2010, that number was down to 23 percent. We spent some time looking at these results from 2010 in comparison with the lay employee population in the plan, which is shown there as the blue line. Looks remarkably similar. And looking at those, we thought that perhaps those curves represented the current makeup of the American workforce. Maybe everyone's workforce had gotten older. Maybe, as the news media would seem to have us believe, all the under 30s really are on their parents' couches. So to get some sort of baseline, we sought out data on age distribution in the U.S. workforce from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And while the U.S. population is aging, as Deborah said, its curve doesn't look anything like our curve. Only 44% of the employed U.S. population is over the age of 45, and more than 77% of our ministers enrolled for benefits are over the age of 45. So what's the potential implication for the Board of Pensions or for the church in this? There is a bubble, a, a pig in the python, we've called it, moving through the system. And when those ministers start to retire in large numbers in just a few years, there may be lots of vacant pulpits. But this may very well be balanced out by one of the other findings from our demographic study, one about the number of churches who may have what we're calling their last called pastor. In a survey of mid-council executives, we asked how many of their churches could be seen as having their last called pastor. That is, when the current pastor moves to another call or retires, the replacement will almost certainly be another form of ministry, a stated supply, a commissioned ruling elder, some other form of ministry, and the responses were all over the board, but the average was three and a half positions per presbytery. Works out to around 600 positions in the denomination where an installed position will, over the course of the next few years, be replaced by a different form of ministry. We've spent most of our time so far talking about who questions, statistics about individuals and groups of individuals, We'll spend a little time t grounding ourselves in an understanding of the different kinds of churches that make up the Presbyterian Church USA. There are just over 10,000 churches in the denomination, and nearly two-thirds of those have at least one participant in the benefits plan. Again, remembering that a median is the middle congregation. There are as many congregations smaller than the median as there are larger than the median. With total church membership declining significantly, and the number of congregations relatively stable by comparison, it's not surprising that the median size of congregations has declined by 40% since reunion, from 151 in 1984 to 93 in 2012. Remembering that any categorization of churches is imprecise, 
in order to think about how different church sizes work, we created three categories, those smaller than 200 members, those between 200 and 500, and those larger than 500. And while there are many more churches in the first group than the other two combined, the aggregate membership in the denomination is nearly evenly divided among those three groups. Interestingly, at least to those of us at the Board of Pensions, these three groups also employ about equal numbers of benefits plan participants. At the smaller end of the membership spectrum, 30% of our membership is in the 75% of congregations with 200 or fewer members. And at the other end of the spectrum, 41% belong to the 8% of our churches with 500 members or more. It is our observation from the Board of Pensions and maybe your experience working in mid-councils as well that these different groupings of churches function very differently and have differing and sometimes competing interests. From the perspective of the Board of Pensions, the abilities of these different churches to manage complex administrative requirements vary wildly. Many large churches have professional administrative and financial staff for whom this work is routine. Most smaller churches, by contrast, have at most one full-time staff person, and when they do, that one staff person is their pastor, not an administrator. From mid-councils, we certainly hear of places where ministry is vibrant and stable, but we also hear more and more about places where the face of ministry is changing rapidly, and indeed many places where it has already changed. In our survey of congregations, 61% of those congregations who did not have an installed pastor had no plans to call one in the next two years. And 20% already had a commissioned ruling elder on staff full or part-time. So having grounded ourselves in the realities of aging populations, a membership that looks less and less like the nation in which we live, and different churches living different kinds of existences, sometimes just blocks apart, we must ask ourselves, what do we do with that information? Do we persist, doing more of the same and hoping for a different result? Or do we endeavor to listen as God calls us in new ways to new places, to go from where we are to that horizon that we see to build God's church deeper and wider? As you work in your committees these next two days, I implore you to think beyond the status quo, past where we are to that horizon where God is calling us. Thank you, Mr. Moderator.